and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 199, The Pacific Theater, Prologue, Sino-Japanese Relations. At the end of the Russo-Japanese War, February 1904 to September 1905, the Treaty of Portsmouth gave Japan the lease of the South Manchurian Railway branch of the China Far East Railway. This branch went from Changchun in central Manchuria south to Lushan, what we would call Port Arthur. And from that time, Japan's interest in Manchuria, economic and political, steadily grew. Before too long, regular Japanese soldiers who guarded the railway started operating outside the rail zone, raiding nearby villages, probably out of boredom more than anything else. But these acts did demonstrate the inability of Chinese authorities to defend their land and people. Their main response was to complain diplomatically, which Tokyo ignored completely. However, Manchurian warlord Zhang Zalin, deciding on more direct tactics, used his army to attempt to stop Japanese aggression in the area. For his pains, he was assassinated by the Guangdong Army, Japan's military force in the area. The warlord's son, Zhang Siyue Liang, now in power, not only stepped up reprisals by harassing, killing, and raping Japanese merchants and peasants, but joined with the Nanjing government leader, Chiang Kai-shek, to reassert Chinese authority in Manchuria in April of 1931. Recently, Chiang had declared that unfair treaties forced on China by Japan were now void. Furthermore, those Chinese or Koreans and Taiwanese who had land and or goods taken from them were due compensation. But again, the Japanese government ignored all of this. In the face of this rise of Chinese nationalism, those officers of the Guangdong army were seriously considering invading Manchuria. This would not only humble the Chinese, but the area's vast resources would greatly help the island nation of Japan. So Guangdong Army Colonel Shishiro Itagaki and Lieutenant Colonel Kanji Ishiwara planned on creating an event that could be used as a pretext for invading the area. But the Japanese Minister of War, Jiro Minami, got wind of their plans and sent a major general to tell the rebellious officers to stand down. This only convinced Seishiro and Kanji that they could not afford to wait for the Chinese to react to their previous aggressive behavior. No, they would have to carry out an act of sabotage themselves, but then make sure the Chinese were blamed. Hence, on September 18, 1931, at 10.20 p.m. local time, explosives were placed near the rail line on a flat patch of land near a bridge. The dynamite was then ignited, but the explosion was so small that the track was not damaged. This was a part of the plan, and in fact, later that night, a train went by, being none the wiser of what had happened earlier that day. The idea was that the explosion would bring Chinese troops closer to investigate. Hence, blame could be placed on them. The next day, September 19th, at the Mukden Officers Club, two large guns were sighted on a nearby Chinese garrison, and shelling commenced. This was in response to the supposed Chinese attack on the rail line leased to Japan by the Treaty of Portsmouth. The warlord's son, now in charge, Chang Siyue Liang's relatively small air force, was quickly taken out by the large guns. The Chinese soldiers of the nearby barracks, of some 7,000, having no such guns to return fire, fled. Soon after, some 500 Japanese soldiers attacked the garrison, yet these men were better equipped and trained, hence had little problem pushing away the Chinese defenders. By that very same evening, the local fighting was over. The Japanese had taken Mukden. Some 500 Chinese soldiers were now dead, along with just two Japanese infantrymen. The commander-in-chief of the Guangdong Army, General Sigiru Honjo, 
had not known of the coming attack. His response was, unsurprisingly, one of shock, but not at the attack itself, but rather having not been informed. The commander, along with those who had planned this, were instilled with the concept of Geiko Kujo, the desire to serve the emperor and people of Japan, regardless if superiors did not agree with their acts or the consequences. And once General Senjuro explained to his superior Shigeru their desire, the latter contentedly ordered Senjuro to send in reinforcements from the Chosen Army of Japan in Korea. Again, there was little to no Chinese resistance. By nightfall, Mukden had become the Guangdong Army's headquarters, and the area was declared secure. It must be said that though the young warlord of Manchuria had an army of some 250,000 troops throughout the area, who possessed tanks, planes, and artillery, and the Japanese had about only 11,000 men nearby, the decision not to fight back was not that of the warlords. Chiang Kai-shek was focused, some would say obsessed, with defeating the Chinese communists who were vying for power first. To Chang's thinking, it was better to let the Japanese run around northeastern China while the Chinese communists were being dealt with. Once they were crushed, could a united China have the political, spiritual, and military wherewithal to push out the invaders? Yet the people of China either didn't know of this policy or didn't care, and labeled the young Manchurian warlord General Non-Resistance. For more on Chiang Kai-shek's fight against the communists, please listen to episodes 119 through 122 of Laszlo Montgomery's fantastic podcast, The China History Podcast. With all of China's internal problems, the communists, breakaway provinces, and the warlords unwilling to work with Chiang Kai-shek, the central government did not have the strength to deal with Japan alone, even diplomatically. Hence, the Chinese foreign minister called on Japan to stop its military operations, but furthermore appealed to the League of Nations for assistance. This appeal came on the very first day of Japanese aggression, September 19th, but only on October 24th did the League pass a resolution that stated that all Japanese troops must leave the contested area by November 16th. This gave the Japanese more than enough time to ignore the resolution, stating they would rather deal directly with the Chinese government. Talks were started, but never went anywhere, as the military leaders of the Guangdong had desired. During all this, the Chinese central government had convened. Those opposed to Chiang Kai-shek used the loss of Mukden as an excuse to force him to step down. He was replaced by Sun Fo, the son of Sun Yat-sen, Chang's mentor. However, the Japanese kept adding to the territory under their control. When the nearby city of Liaoning was lost, Sun himself was forced down as well. He was replaced by Wang Jiwei, another nationalist hero. This musical chairs of the country's leadership did not help in its fight against the communists or Japanese. In January of 1932, United States Secretary of State Henry Stimson declared that the United States would not recognize any government set up by Japanese military action in Manchuria. Yet the Japanese responded by establishing the puppet state of Manchukuo in March. The former Emperor of China, Pu Yi, forced to step down in 1912, was made head of state a year later. See the film, The Last Emperor. The League of Nations joined the United States in not recognizing Manchukuo. Japan ignored this as well and resigned from the ineffectual League in March of 1933. Japan continued to secure Manchuria as it gave them access to vital natural resources. They were unable to get from the West due to tariffs that started after the Great Depression. But further, Manchukuo was itself a ready-made market for goods finished in Japan proper, and lastly, it offered a buffer zone against Soviet forces in Siberia, to the north and northwest. 
But the story of Japanese desire to increase its holdings at the expense of China does not stop here. Going back a bit, in early 1932, Japan had by then gained control of the vast northeastern region of China. It would eventually reform into Manchukuo. Yet Tokyo wanted more, and really there was nothing to stop them, except their own ambition, and they had learned well from the history of the Western powers. The next target would be 639 miles, or 1,029 kilometers, south of Manchuria, specifically Port Arthur, to the south at Shanghai. The Japanese already had a concession there, a stretch of land administered by them, as did several Western powers. Still, the Empire wanted to control more of this vital port city and its surrounding territory. Yet again, the Japanese military leaders felt they needed a casus belli to justify this latest land grab. So in early January 1932, Japanese agents began agitating the local Chinese population there. This tension spilled out on January 18th, when five Japanese Buddhist monks were attacked and beaten by a crowd. One of the monks died from his wounds. When night came, a factory was burnt down as well. The local Chinese police took to the streets to calm the protesters, but ended up clashing with the mob. One policeman was killed as well. For the next few days, the people of Shanghai marched in the streets, protesting, and called for a boycott of all Japanese-made goods. The tension grew over the next week. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History, wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. During this time, Japanese forces were being built up along the northern border of Shanghai. By January 27th, some 30 ships... 40 aircraft, and some 7,000 soldiers were in close proximity. When asked about this force, the Japanese military said it was only to keep safe the Japanese concession and its people. Tokyo would go on to deliver an ultimatum and demand compensation for any damaged Japanese property. But this was, in reality, only to fan the flames of tension. And it worked. At another point along Shanghai's border, the Chinese 19th Route Army was stationed and had, in fact, also been increasing its numbers. But the Shanghainese weren't happy about this, either. The 19th Route Army was known to be nothing more than a force controlled by a local Chinese warlord. The Shanghai Council desired that they leave, lest their presence give the Japanese an excuse to invade. The Western-controlled concessions weren't any happier about the 19th Route Force's presence. So, taking the initiative, the city government paid a bribe to the warlord force, hoping it would go away. Yet they did not. Having set up this game board, the Japanese launched bombers from a nearby carrier and bombed parts of Shanghai on January 28th, to be known as the January 28th Incident. 
After the bombing, 3,000 Japanese troops invaded the northern part of Shanghai, again, supposedly, to protect the Japanese concession. A train station was occupied, as well as several other key points in the northern half of the city. However, unexpectedly, by most anyway, the 19th Route Army moved in and offered resistance to the invaders. The why of this is not known, but it could have been simple nationalism. Confirming everyone's worst fears, the fighting spread to other parts of Shanghai's international settlement. Yet the western-held areas were spared. The Japanese continued to pour troops into the area. On January 30th, Chiang Kai-shek announced that, temporarily, due to the fighting, the capital, currently in Nanjing, some 300 kilometers to the northwest of Shanghai, would be moved further to the northwest, at Liaoyang, some 740 kilometers further away. Now, events moved apace, as the United States, the United Kingdom, and France also had concessions in Shanghai, they urged the two warring sides to put down their arms and begin peace talks. But the Japanese had what they wanted. Soon the number of Japanese troops was increased significantly, along with 80 warships and 300 aircraft. Chiang Kai-shek responded by sending in the 5th Army. But as this force had no air or armored support, the ever-increasing Japanese force gained ground. On March 2nd, the 19th Route Army and Chiang Kai-shek's 5th Army retreated from Shanghai. The League of Nations tried again to stop the fighting and sent representatives to the beleaguered city, but only on May 5th was an agreement signed, called the Shanghai Ceasefire Agreement. It declared that the city would become a demilitarized zone, that the Chinese were forbade to station troops in or near their own city. With the fighting over, Chang sent the 19th Route Army to Fujian, to the south, to suppress the communists there. But after a negotiated peace between the two, the 19th Route set up its own Fujian People's Government. Chiang Kai-shek had another would-be ruler on his hands to deal with. Technically, Chang's government and Japan were at peace, yet there was still fighting in Manchuria, as Chinese volunteer armies rose to do what Chiang would not. It must be noted that Chiang's power really only centered around the Yangtze River Delta. The rest of China was controlled by various warlords. The Japanese military on the mainland would go on to instigate other rebellions and assist other Chinese warlords in establishing their own pro-Japanese governments. A year after the fighting over Shanghai, the Japanese officials of the Guangdong Army would launch Operation Neka. Its goal was to add territory to Manchu Kuo, taking from China the area to the north of the Great Wall near the coast. Near the eastern end of the Great Wall, there is a major pass called Shanghai Guan, or Shanghai Pass. There, the Japanese had a small garrison of only 200 soldiers. But on the night of January 1, 1933, the local Japanese commander staged another incident by exploding a handful of grenades and firing off several rounds. This, the Guangdong Army used to demand that the Chinese 626th Regiment of the Northeastern Army abandon the pass. The Chinese refused, of course, so the Japanese 8th Division then went in and attacked, supported by four armored trains and tanks, all with close air support. By January 3rd, just two days later, the Chinese regimental commander evacuated. He had put up a fight, but lost half of his force. With the pass now firmly in Japanese hands, the next target was the province of Erha, spelled R-E-H-E, on the northern side of the Great Wall. Instead of creating an incident, this time, the local Japanese officials declared that, as the province was historically a part of Manchuria, now controlled by the Japanese, it should be handed over 
peacefully. Yet, behind the scenes, the Guangdong leadership was attempting to seduce the local military commander there, General Tang Yulin. But both maneuvers failed, so the military would again be used. However, as this was an outright attack, with no clash of arms to use an excuse, the Japanese army's chief of staff first had to ask for permission from the emperor Hirohito. The emperor had no real power, but could not be ignored either. So within his guidelines to reign instead of ruling, Hirohito believed he had come upon the perfect solution. He would approve this strategic operation as it was described to him, but as it was to add territory to Manchuria, it was to be the last of such actions. Furthermore, Japanese forces were not to go south of the Great Wall. The attack started on February 23, 1933. Within the first two days, two major cities were taken, Chaoyang and Kailu. But then the Japanese, in the form of the 4th Cavalry Brigade, ran into the forces of the local warlord there, Sung Di Yang Ying. The Chinese fought tenaciously, but were, again, out-equipped and outmanned. By March 2nd, the 4th Cavalry Brigade pushed the defenders back and took another city, Qingfeng. Now that the way was open, the 4th Cavalry, now joined by the 1st Special Tank Company, pushed forward and took Chengdu, the capital of Irhu. During the fighting, other forces, such as General Wan Fulin's 32nd Corps, General Song Zhuyang's 29th Corps, Zhang Su Liang's 37th Division, and General Guan Lin Jiang's 25th Division also had been attempting to stop the invaders. But now, as the warlord's forces, the tip of the spear, had been defeated, the rest fell back. The 32nd retreated to the Lung Ko Pass, a major gate within the wall, while the 29th made its way closer to the wall in general. This left the 37th and 25th making their way to separate passes. To lose the city of Erhan was one thing, but the passes were much more important, as they opened the way to the rest of the vital half of eastern China. Chiang Kai-shek reluctantly called on other forces, currently battling the hated communists, but their arrival would be too late. On March 11th, the Japanese forces pushed their way to the Great Wall itself. What followed was at least 20 separate attacks by the Japanese. Again, the Chinese were out-equipped, mostly fighting with a few heavy guns, trench mortars, some machine guns, but mostly with handguns and traditional Chinese swords. Still, they resisted and held up the attackers longer than they should have. But the inevitable happened. One by one, the various passes fell to the Japanese as the defenders were forced back. On May 20th, what remaining defending forces were still at the wall retreated to the south. On May 22nd, 1933, the two sides sent representatives to Tenggu, Tianjin, or Nanjing. The Tengu truce stipulated that there would be a demilitarized zone 100 kilometers south of the Great Wall. Obviously, this seriously hampered the Chinese from defending their territory below the wall. On the other hand, the Japanese were allowed to use reconnaissance aircraft and small amounts of ground troops to make sure the Chinese stayed compliant with the treaty. This aspect alone of the treaty guaranteed future clashes. Also, the Chinese government was made to accept the de facto independence of Manchukuo and the loss of Irhu. Once again, there was peace, at least on paper. But the Japanese would continue to prop up various factions, which would be turned into local governments and they, with Japanese military assistance, would force the Chinese government to sign agreements that would bar the Chinese KMT, or the Nationalist Party of China, from conducting party or military operations there. Over the next two years, the northern part of China 
was abandoned by the Chinese government, regardless of who was at the top. This peace would last for the next four years, in various forms. The Chinese citizen armies to the north were still fighting to retake Manchuria, which kept the Japanese on their toes and wary of any other attempts by the Chinese, whether they be from nationalist, communist, or warlord, hoping to push out the invaders. Yet the seeds for further conflict had long since been sowed. The Boxer Protocol, set back in 1901, allowed foreign nations who had legations in Beijing the right to post guards at specific points along the railways, connecting Beijing with Nanjing. A further agreement said that those forces could conduct maneuvers without asking permission or informing local Chinese authorities. By mid-1937, the Japanese had some 10,000 men along the railways. Of course, this was a much larger force than allowed by the Boxer Accord, but most of its stipulations had been broken already. The Japanese used this part of the agreement to surround Beijing and Nanjing, supposedly for security purposes only. On July 7, 1937, the Japanese units in Fungtai, a southwestern district of the municipality of the Beijing district, started their maneuvers that night and left their base at Fungtai proper. Hard by is the Marco Polo Bridge, or Lungo Bridge, that spans the Yongding River. On the eastern side of the waterway stands the Wanping Fortress, or castle, built by the Ming Dynasty in 1638. Stationed within and around was the 219th Regiment of the Chinese 29th Route Army. However it happened, and the details are fuzzy, the roving Japanese forces exchanged fire with Chinese soldiers just outside the walled town at 11 p.m. local time. They pulled back, but then it was noticed that one Japanese soldier, Private Shimura Kikujiro, had not returned to his post. Thinking the worst, his commander sent a message to the Chinese regimental commander, Ji Sing Wen, demanding to search within the walled city for his missing man. The Chinese commander refused, rightly so, and the private soon made his way back to camp. But by then, the Japanese forces had already deployed around Wangping, the walled city. A few hours later, the Japanese attempted to force their way into the city, but the Chinese defenders fought them to a standstill. The Japanese then sent an ultimatum to the Chinese commander, Ching Du Chun, but this was ignored. Yet, knowing what was coming, Qing sent word to nearby commanders, telling them to place their troops on high alert. The peace that held, roughly speaking, since 1933, was about to be shattered. 